pull it up here and share it. I just noticed. Has it? Here yet. I have been playing with um, a carnivore diet. And, of course, that goes against everything that government schools have taught us we should eat. <laughs> um, Actually, however, that's not, that's not true, I, you know, because they, you know, meat is, is good usually. Well, the food pyramid would tell you that the meat is the least amount of anything you should eat. Yeah, I and think if, that's old, though. I, I, guess I don't think, is that still a thing? I mean... Uh, they, they, I've, revised I've it. Heard... They, they revised it once once people figured out, wait a minute, carbs are killing us. Uh, you don't right, need that yeah, much bread I've, and pasta. I was going to say, I mean, I've heard that, you know, a lot of people now, I, I don't know if it's schools, but, you know, are pushing a, a much, much more meat in your diet uh, because of the lack of carbs and that sort of thing. Well, I got, uh, I, there's plenty of people on YouTube and, you know, hey, I, a couple of them may be quacks. I don't know, but a couple of them have a lot of credentials. The, and The U of Tube. The U of Tube. There's a channel, a lady calls herself Steak and Butter Gal or Steak and Butter Girl or something like that. And uh, and, and she gives you advice about, you know, maintaining a uh, carnivore diet and what to look out for. And, you know, it might give you, di if, if you get diarrhea, eat some cheese. Um uh, so I, I've, I've just, I've been, so I've been eating a lot of steaks lately and uh, I must say for the most part, I've been really satiated. You know, like, no, I'm full. I don't want anything else. I just had to tell you, I am a sucker for a good steak. That is one, like a dinner food that I really, really enjoy. Yeah. This yeah. Thing is messed up. I'm trying to, I've got a cordless ip phone for one of the i have two phones for work i have one upstairs and one downstairs here in my office and the, the one for upstairs the cordless this little box here is just doesn't like the power cord or something oh well i'll deal with it later i'm still sharing this out because my share this out to uh the tort show Tort page Forced to do that, it has to switch and do all kinds of things. Blah 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 blah. Okay. Done with that, and let's share it out one more place. So I, I don't have any conditions that people often go on a carnivore diet to try to fix, like diverticulitis and, and uh, other digestive issues. And, and uh, sure. some people say that they solve their problems that way. Um, I just wanted to kind of get off the, the carb merry-go-round because I do right. find myself yeah. easily getting into that. Um, really, just too easily. Um, like I'll buy, yeah. you know, three half gallons of ice cream and, and I, a day and a <laughs> half later I realize, where did the ice cream go? I didn't tell Carmen about it. I didn't tell Michael about it. <laughs> really? I ate the ice cream? That's all you. <laughs> oh, man. You, you know, and, and, you know, just because the diabetes and everything, so forever I've always eaten low carb. So I really don't eat a lot of that kind of stuff. Now, every once in a while, that's one of the nice things about an insulin bump. Every once in a while, I'll treat myself to like a root beer float or something and just do a little extra insulin. But I generally, you know, it's a lot of meats, a lot of... um a lot of vegetables, uh, you know, obviously diet drinks, but that's also one of the reasons I don't, you know, other than I don't really enjoy it. But one of the reasons I don't drink a whole lot is, you know, you'd be amazed the amount of sugar and carbs and stuff in some of that, those drinks. Well, and that's, well, and, and alcoholic beverages. I, I saw my doctor a few months ago and, and told him I was really working on getting, you know, just getting 15 pounds off. And sure. I said, I'm, eat, I'm eating all organic. My wife is a former chef. She cook everything is so healthy and so tasty and lots of garlic and, and a little, you know, proper amounts of fat. And it's just really good food, frankly, better than any restaurants we go to typically. Oh, sure. And I, and I, and I said, but I think my downfall is we, we often will have most of a bottle of wine with dinner. And he said, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's. A glass is right good. There. A bottle is a little much. Well, a bottles just what two and a half glasses each. Yeah, yeah, that's all. You that's know, all. No big deal. Yeah. Then there's the tequila nightcap. Right, right. Once well, you know, my doctor is always telling you, he's like, you know, a glass of wine at night is good. Five glasses of wine at night is not. No, no. Yeah, we we, we well, need thanks for ruining that for me. That's great. Yeah, yeah. 
And she's so good at wine pairing. You know, we'll have some something that she oh, learned to yeah. cook in, in Spain, and then we go to the store, and she'll she'll get like five Portuguese wines, and they're typically not expensive. Typically sure. twelve bucks a bottle or under. Some, you know, we go to Sam's Club, and we find perfectly good Spanish wines for six and a half dollars a bottle. Right. Yeah. 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 I know, uh, you know, I, I know a few people like that who are just really masters at pairing wines and stuff, and you get you get spoiled, for sure. I, I, I know it's, it's time to start. Uh, I left yep. my mo- notes on the printer, so give me one sec to go grab that. Okay, well, welcome to This Week in Radio Tech, everybody. <laughs> Watching before the show starts, I am not Kirk Harnack. <laughs> Kirk Harnack will be back. He's around somewhere. Oh, there he is. He's wandering the halls. That's right. It's where we usually find you. (laughs) Wandering the halls without a hall pass. Right. That's me. Right. (laughs) Usually in some kind of straight jacket or (laughs) hospital robe gown. Yeah. Yeah. It's chilly in here, but only in the back. (laughs) (laughs) A little drafty. Crafty. Okay, here we go. Hi, everybody. I'm glad you're uh, joining us on the network live. Chris Tarr and I and are here. Uh, also, we have some guest appearances from Robert Combs coming up and Dominic Mitchum. Now, they are pre-recorded, so they're not with us live today, but uh, I was able to uh, go ahead and edit together a really nice um, story, really nice experience with them, complete with B-roll. So we have pictures and, and video that they're talking about, so that's going to be enjoyable. Um, our topic today is going to be uh, transmitters, brand new or new to me. And Chris is tar. Chris, you're, you're going to have a story about a transmitter that's new to you, right? Oh yeah, oh, I've got a couple. I've I've done in the past year two or three. Yeah, okay, that's right. And we even did a we even did a show about one of these. I remember you had a forklift picture or something. Oh yeah, yeah, that was the first yeah. one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get started here. It's already three after the hour, so here we go. It's twerk number six eighty nine. And we'll start the show in three, two, a welcome into this week in radio tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee in the Telos Alliance studio. And my goodness, it's uh, it's looking like springtime. I I know it is springtime. Uh, It's been meteorological spring since March 1st. It's been spring, spring uh, since uh, what, March 21st or so. So we're a week into it. We finally have a beautiful, warm day. The sun's shining. My, I'm so happy my uh, my solar system on the roof has been cranking out the power today. We actually sold uh, power back to the power company uh, almost all day today, although the sun now is uh, is waning. Hey, anyway, enough about that. Uh, glad you're here with us, and let's check in with Chris Tarr, where it's uh, sunny in Muckwanago. Hey, Chris. Hi. It is, although I, I don't think that Wisconsin got the memo yet about spring. <laughs> Uh, really it's yeah well, we're 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 in that weird part of the year up here where you know the days are warm and the nights are freezing so you know it's it's actually it's 44 right now it got up to 50 the other day but then it's like 27 26 at night so mm-hmm. we're still kind of yeah. at that spot and then it takes a while in the day to get really warm so in the morning it's still like 30 degrees so hopefully another few weeks we'll start to uh, to see those nights because we're getting spoiled. We had a couple of those days where they were in the 60s and we're getting mm-hmm. spoiled, you know, because even in the 40s, I'll wear shorts outside because, you know, Wisconsin. But I, I'm waiting for the for spring to actually get here. Here would be nice. I noticed that uh, I was watching the the power usage on the house here and I noticed, hey, why did it bump up to, uh, to four and a half kilowatts? Now six kilowatts. What is the air conditioner? Both air conditioners are on at the same time. Sure enough, <laughs> the air conditioning kicked on. I'm gonna have to go. Oh yeah, diddle with the set points. It's, it's, uh, I need to save some more electricity. Oh. Yeah. Hey, uh, Chris, our our topic today is talking about uh, transmitters that are either brand new or new to me. And I, you know, I love it when a, a plan or uh, when a, an impromptu plan uh, comes together. Last week, I got word. Well, actually, I saw it on Facebook that Robert Combs and Dominic Mitchum were installing a new uh, transmitter, a 30 kilowatt Harris, uh, I guess a, a Fax 30 maybe, uh, sure. in, um, in, in uh, just north of Huntsville, Alabama for the, the cumulus cluster in Huntsville. And I thought, that's just down the road. I mean, that's okay. It's a, it, uh, just about a two hour drive. I thought, sure, I, I, I'm gonna see if they're still gonna be there. So I got in a car on Friday, Friday afternoon, 
Zoom down there and uh, had a great conversation and took video. We did a whole interview and B-roll video. It, it's it's better than a live show, <laughs> at least. Yeah, it's it's going to be. I'm good. sure That's of it. Up. I'm absolutely sure of it. Uh, and and you know Robert Combs. If you if you guys don't know Robert Combs, this man is so full of wisdom. He is he's just a he's an old soft shoe at, at this kind of stuff. You know he uh, he has installed sixty transmitters in the last eight years. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. Wow. Uh, he, I asked him, I said, well, you're, you're putting this big, you know, uh, uh, this big Harris transmitter, you do other ones. He said, oh yeah, we use, we use all the major manufacturers, just whichever is appropriate, sure. uh, for the, for the power level, uh, the size, the airflow, uh, and sometimes it's price dependent, you know, sometimes, Hey, which one we're going to buy? Well, and I think that's pretty common. You know, people ask, well, what, you know, what do you buy? Well, I, I buy whatever works for the job, you know? And some of that is price. Some of that is features at any given moment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, at, at one point I'd bought some, uh, some, some Gates air faxes because at that time the feature set was a little bit ahead of what Nutella is doing. Now Nutella is a new transmitter out uh, that has some of those features. So uh, it really is, you know, I'm not sold on any one brand and I think it's, I don't think it's, it's a good idea to do that. I think you want the manufacturers to kind of compete with each other uh, you know, not only for your business, but for, uh, you know, business in general, because I think that just, again, that the rising tide lifts all the boats. So, you know, to get to keep them on their toes, I think is great. The, uh, the only expensive thing you should be really loyal to would be your wife. Exactly. <laughs> That'd be a good idea. Hey, yeah. hey, Chris, we're gonna talk about, uh, Nautel and the Nautel users group, uh, radio technology forum coming up at NAB. If you're going to be anywhere near Las Vegas. Well, you're probably going to NAB if you're near it. But anyway, um, you shouldn't miss the Nautel Radio Technology Forum or the, the, the NUG, the Nautel Users Group is what it has been called. It's going on Sunday morning, April the 14th in Las Vegas. Starts at 8.30 in the morning. They're going to serve uh, a lunch, 8.30 a.m. until 1 p.m. It's at the Flamingo Las Vegas um, in the scenic and twilight ballrooms. And I think that's where they've, they've been having it. Um, they're going to have their, their industry briefing breakfast at 8.30, so they're serving breakfast there. Um, they're going to have the full session uh, from 8.30 till 1. I think their first people are talking while you're eating. And then they'll have the uh, optional afternoon sessions uh, about HD radio. If you're new to HD radio or you need a little uh, brush up, uh, HD radio 101 and uh, AUI, advanced user interface, and you can find out what all those squiggly lines on your Nautel transmitter mean. So um, uh, what you need to do is, is register for this. It's free to register. The whole thing is, is, is free of charge. You don't have to dress up. You can dress comfortably or you can dress up. It's up to you. Um, and uh, uh, there's, a w there's a link to, uh, to register. You can just go to the Nautel website, nautel.com. Um, the full link is nautel.com slash NAB slash NUG hyphen registration. That's too much to remember, at least for me anyway. So just go to the Nautel website. You'll see it there easily. You can register for free. And uh, and they'll save you a place. They'll order extra pancakes and sausage and eggs for you, and and you can enjoy this thing. It's I've been to several of these. Really good. It is action packed. Well, it's information packed. Let's hope there's not too much action. And um, then after you're finished with that, then you can go to the uh, uh, the NAB show floor. All right. Hope to see you there, Chris. Do you have a chance to come to NAB this year or not? No, I will not be there. I've got. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, I still got a lot of stuff going on. We're we're winding down now, but. We're still have a few more tricks up our sleeves. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to the uh, public radio engineering conference. I'll be uh, yep. presenting something there. And also the, uh, the SBE NS workshop um, that yeah. is before the NAB starts. So actually I think I'm speaking twice there. Uh, Jeff Welton is in charge of one day and he asked me to speak. And uh, then um, speak, I'm speaking uh, another day too. So anyway, there you go. All right. That's coming up. Register for that from Nautel. All right, Chris, uh, let's, without further ado, uh, let's take a look at this at this video. Let's go ahead and roll the video. I'm going to talk over the first few seconds of it here, if you want to do that, uh, Suncast. So this is the drive uh, up the hill. They said, bring your four-wheel drive, although, frankly, they had improved the road. Uh, the road was terrible, and they got the landowners, there's me, uh, got the landowners to uh, put gravel, improve the whole road, but they had a couple of big rainstorms that already started digging new um, bad places in the road. Watch this. <laughs> Such a card. All right. And uh, 
up the hill we go. It's a, it's a windy road up the hill. It's not bad, though. It's not, not too terribly steep. Fun to drive, actually. There are several towers at the top of this hill. Oh, they call it Capshaw Mountain. Well, it's not what some people would define as a mountain. But they call it a mountain. Capshaw Mountain sounds more impressive than Capshaw Hill. So, there's a bumpy part right there where the rain had already eaten through part of the of the road. And lots of telephony boxes. Uh, fiber up on the hill. We'll talk about that as we get into it here. There's, I guess this is where the new gravel stops and the original gravel continues. Still, it wasn't too bad. More utility boxes. And uh, one passing one more transmitter building. And I will be quiet from this point. Here we go. Pulling into the transmitter building. Long into Cumulus. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack along with Dominic and Robert. And we are here in Huntsville, Alabama, just outside of Huntsville, on a hill. And Dominic, you're the local engineer. Tell me about this hill. Where are we exactly? Well, the locals here call it Capshaw Mountain. Now, oh. mountain would be something that's 20,000 feet or more high. This is like 440 feet, so Capshaw Mountain. Capshaw Mountain, and it's, uh, it's kind of crowded up here. It is uh, crowded if you're in a communications business. So yeah. Right here, we've got radio and television. And uh, just down the road is a major cell tower uh, with a lot of carriers on it. Well, we're here because uh, Robert Combs is here, and he posted on Facebook a few days ago about a new transmitter installation. And I said, hey, that's just down the road from me, road trip, and I get to see Robert, too. So, uh, Robert, uh, good to see you, and tell me why you're here. Well, as the Corporate Director of Engineering for Cumulus, um, I travel around helping with installs, studios, transmitters, and I'm pretty much the transmitter guy ah. for Cumulus. And I deal with the manufacturers, I deal with the installs, I deal with everything pertaining to it. So. Now, you told me earlier that you've got kind of a variety of different transmitter brands and sizes depending on pricing and power required and all that kind of thing. Now, you said you have installed a lot of these uh, Gates Air transmitters. Yes, um, I've, this was number 60. 60? Six, six zero. Since uh, 2016 or 2015. Oh my goodness. So, well, that's almost 10 a year, right? Pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. Wow. Wow. All right. So, um, tell me about the licensed facilities here. Seems like a pretty high TPO here. Well, here originally, uh, the license is for a 54 kilowatt TPO okay. because we had a four bay antenna at 650 feet. So at the time, we had two 30-kilowatt transmitters combined to make 54 kilowatts, and it's a 100,000-watt radio station. Okay. So we are now going back to running just one transmitter, um, which our TPO will be 27 kilowatts. We're working on the CP now, yeah. but we're running under an STA, which we filed an STA with the FCC, um, to run it, reduce power. Uh, we have an antenna, which... Uh, You'll be able to show them here, sitting in a box, ready to go. Um, and we're going to replace the auxiliary antenna at the same time. Because um, right now we have a 10-bay Phelps Dodge, oh, okay. which okay. is older than I am. Wow. So wow. we're going to put a, a four-bay ERI up uh, for that as well. Now, Robert, as he should have, used a lot of acronyms in describing what's going on here. And most of you in our audience know what those acronyms mean. I'm going to go back over a couple of TPO. That's transmitter power output. This is uh, what your FCC license says. How much power can I put out of the transmitter? And that power on your license takes into account two more things beyond the transmitter. The type and length of transmission line, because you're going to lose a little bit of power as heat in the transmission line. And it has to do with the gain of the antenna. Now, Robert, you said that right now you still have, and you, you have had a four bay antenna. Four bay antenna. And that's got a gain of a little over 2.0, right? Right about, we usually, for every two bays, it's around a gain of one. Yeah. So yeah. a four bay would be a gain of two, and we're going with an eight bay, which will be right above four. So uh, the, the antenna that's up there now, Four bay antenna, gain of two. You got to put 50,000 watts in the bottom of the antenna or in the middle of it, wherever it is, uh, to get 100,000 watts of effective power out. Uh, when you put, when you replace that antenna with the eight bay, 
it only requires half of that actual power, right? We'll be doing 27 kilowatts yeah. out is what uh, we're our math is doing. If our math is mathing right. Yeah, and, uh, and you'll lose a little bit in the transmission line. Right, we will, yeah. we will lose, uh, it's 700 feet of three inch line, three and an eight. Now, we're standing here in front of this operating transmitter and it's putting out how much right now? 27 and a half? We're doing 15, oh, 15 out of it right now. The C, the STA uh, is, uh, we put in for running at 30% of okay. our license power. Okay. So we're getting, we're with line loss, we'll be right around 28 kilowatts out. Um, but that way we're okay. The FCC knows yeah. we're doing it and we're not operating illegally. So. Gotcha. But when the new antenna goes up with a higher gain, then you'll you'll be able to put out your full 100 kilowatt of effective power. Right, and yeah. you'll be able to hear it at your house in Nashville. <laughs> yeah, well, I live a two-hour drive up the road. I know because I just drove it. <laughs> this uh, this site, uh, you said, uh, Kirk, you may want to bring a four-wheel drive with you. So I got to I got to try out the four-wheel drive on the on the 25-year-old Toyota Forerunner. You know, it's not a bad road though, really. We we just uh, the owner of this tower. We sold the tower. Uh, to someone and they we asked them knowing we were going to bring all this up ah. to fix the road last year and they did a great job now dominic you were responsible for uh taking the transmitter that was sitting here out tell me about that process of decommissioning a transmitter which really it could stand alone but it was actually half of a pair of a pair of transmitters. Yes, that's right. So right over here uh, is an HT30, ah. the Harris HT30. Yep. Uh, it was uh, there was a separate cabinet just like it, right behind where I'm standing. Okay. And it was uh, connected in with that cabinet to what a combiner unit. And so as part of the planning, what went into this whole project here, the idea was to isolate that transmitter only to the main antenna, and then dismantle the other cabinet over here and its power supply by behind us is a big power supply with a big hunk of iron in it there was a separate power supply for that ah. and so once we got the plan in place there we dismantled that and then basically had a moving company come in and pick up the hard Ooh. heavy iron and haul it away and at the same time bring in this new box which is actually lighter and takes up far less room maybe right. about half and as you, uh, you know, as you can see, it's operating. Now, if the 30 kilowatt tube type transmitter went away, and you said the power supply for it also went away, right? Yes. And I'm guessing the combiner also went away. Yes, it did. And in, in order to make room for what we are bringing in here with the new antenna and the course of the new transmitter, we had to get rid of those parts. There's, you know, there was no need for the combiner since we're going to use one transmitter into a bigger antenna, which extra bays, as Robert pointed out. So it was not necessary to have that here. So as part of the project to dismantle, we dismantled that as well. I want to go back and explain uh, one more concept that a lot of stations, I think maybe when electricity was cheaper, um, it, it's, it's often been felt by engineers that the fewer FM bays, kind of the better. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. If you have a lot of bays, a, uh, an antenna with a lot of gain, well, you've got a main lobe coming out of it, but you've also got all these little side lobes above and, be and below. And they can create some areas of difficult reception, at least in the vicinity of, of the tower. Uh, or if you've got some of your listening area is at a lower elevation. Like if you're on a mountain and you're trying to hit a city and you've got uh, this scalloping uh, uh, signal level uh, from a multi-bay antenna, that can be problematic. So the thought has often been fewer bays gives you a fatter signal that, that goes out. And, and th there's some truth to that. Um, it's not always important, but sometimes it is important. And the other factor, though, is the fewer the bays up there, the fewer the parts that are up there, and the fewer things to go wrong up there. And uh, fixing things up there costs more money because you got to get a tower crew out and, and all the accoutrement that goes along with that. Now, in my humble opinion, you know, four bay antenna is great, but man, you spend a lot of money on electricity down here at the bottom when you're trying to pump out 100,000 watts. Um, an eight bay antenna, which is what you're going to put up, uh, I think that's a pretty good compromise. I, I don't mind having eight bays up in the air for a 100 kilowatt signal. How do you feel about all that? To me, the eight bay antenna is the best. Uh -huh. um, it's the perfect 
number of bays to me because you still get great building penetration because that's another reason to go with less bays because it's more RF, therefore better building penetration. But you still get great building penetration, but you can also get the distance yeah. with an eight bay. Yeah. And yeah. like you said, less electricity on the ground. So There's one more factor we haven't mentioned, and maybe you've done this at some other sites. Uh, I take it the new antenna is going to be a full wave spaced antenna. Uh, gaining some popularity yeah, for the last 20 years or so has been these half wave spaced antennas, especially when you've got people or apartments or things like that below the antenna. A half wave space uh, has uh, less gain, uh, lots of parts up there, but a lot less downward radiation. I take it here on this mountaintop with nobody else that the public is not in here, that's not a real factor, is it? That's right. We're we're isolated at the top. There are houses below at the foot of the mountain, but everything else up here is RF already. So, um, and it's tall enough tower where our RF, our RFR, the radiation on the ground level, is still within standards. Yeah, I guess if, if we were on a real mountaintop site with a 100-foot tower with an 8-bay antenna on that, and that gets problematic when the bottom bay is not too far away from you. Yeah, when you go up out to L.A., Mount Wilson, oh yeah, or you know Bruno yeah. in San Francisco, and yeah, you can touch the bottom bay of the antenna. You got to watch it there, but here we're okay. So, um, Dominic, uh, you used to have two transmitters here operating in parallel, and I understand you. you correct me if I'm wrong, or add to it. You got one FM exciter and that signal is split to both transmitters, there's an adjustment on the timing of at least of one of those yes. to get your phase corrected. Each transmitter amplifies that signal from the same exciter, yes. and then they combine back together, yes. hopefully in good phase, yes. and so the power from both goes up the tower. Do I, do I have that right? Yes, you're exactly right. I, I practically, you've explained everything pretty much in good principle. Uh, so. You know that the once that signal is split and the phase is monitored by the transmitter's phase controller. Oh, and it's comparing that to what the output is doing to keep the two in phase or in check, so that one transmitter doesn't run away as with, from the other one and keeps both balanced uh, with the same output power levels and uh, and also just the, that that phase is is important for the uh, balance of the coupling of the transmitter, so one is not canceling out the other. Sure, sure. You know that's that's uh, uh, more sophisticated than I've ever dealt with, uh, Robert. You st you still have some dual transmitter systems w in the company, don't you? We just did uh, a couple of years ago. I did a uh, sixty kilowatt in Nashville um, because we had the situation. We got a four bay antenna yeah. at the top of a thousand foot tower, and so we needed. I think we were doing forty eight. Wow! Out of that um, transmitter. So we basically, there's 230, two of this one combined um, with a controller um, and it has the electronic phasing and, and combiner and all that. Um, of course, you have two dummy loads hooked to it because you're wasting, you've got a lot of heat coming out of that one. So I, I think I visited that site maybe in the mid 90s and I want to say there were two CCA transmitters there at the time. Well, I took out two uh, HT25. Oh wow! So they had replaced the CCAs. Okay. I did see the carcass of one. Yeah. It is. It was there. It's not anymore, but it was there. And now those old CCAs, uh, there was no automatic adjustment. There was a little trombone section right. to adjust the phasing. So I guess you adjust that what for the minimum uh, reject power on the combiner. Right. You uh, and the, that was the way the HTs were. Oh. There at the same time they had a big complex network, three inch line going everywhere, six inch coming out. And, but yes, you had to, it's just like tuning an AM almost, yeah, yeah. Um, but you had to get it perfect. But now they make them with automatic transmission. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All you do is put it in drive and go. <laughs> All right. That is the first part of our interview. We've got part two coming up for you in just a minute after the break. I'm Kirk Harnack. Uh, Chris Tarr is going to be rejoining us with uh, some stories of his own in just a few minutes. You're watching This Week in Radio Tech. 
It's our uh, 689th episode, so glad you're here. Hey, and while we have a moment together, um, if you don't mind, it would, would you like and subscribe if you haven't already? Make sure you're, if you're watching on YouTube, you know, uh, uh, subscribe to our channel, uh, like the video. That's really appreciated. Uh, same thing uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, you know, l like the video. Uh, we have a, an actual channel on, um, on Facebook, This Week in Radio Tech, Twerked This Week in Radio Tech. When we're doing the live show, uh, we just share the video that comes from uh, GFQ Network, guys from Queens. That's uh, that's the uh, company that that distributes and, and produces our show. So anyway, if you would uh, take care of that, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, coming up, uh, part two in just a few minutes, and, or just a couple minutes. Right now, we're going to hear a word from my friends and your friends at a business that will, they make stuff that make producing great radio easier and all the social media that needs to go along with that in today's world. It's Broadcast Bionics. We'll be right back. Camera One from Broadcast Bionics. Designed to bring video to your audio content. Visualizing radio and podcasts for social media. Camera One can automatically create, capture and brand professionally switched video for live streaming or upload, making your production shareable. Control and configure using a web browser on any device. Camera One is available as a 4-camera or 8-camera system using the Blackmagic A10 Mini range, including the A10 Mini Extreme. You can use cameras to suit your studio and your budget. You'll need one camera for a studio wide shot and usually one camera per microphone. A standard multi-channel sound card or IP driver monitors audio from each studio microphone and we work natively with Axia systems. Ideally, this will be a post-fader feed from each mic, although you can use pre-fade audio or a mic split if that's all you have available. These audio levels are used to intelligently switch the video feed when each contributor is talking. You can also group microphones together into one shot and use the audio from a mixer's aux bus. You can use Camera One's auto switch feature or disable it and switch using the on-screen buttons or the buttons on the ATEM. Recordings can automatically start when you tell the system you're on the air. This on-air indication can be linked to your studio's red lights via IP or an Avantec Adam GPIO interface. You can quickly browse all the videos that have been automatically created during your broadcast, download them and post. Camera One is a user installable system. You'll need a good spec Windows 10 PC, i7 with plenty of storage and 16 gig of RAM. It's better if this machine isn't used for anything else. Remember, you can control the software in a web browser on another device on your network. Camera One, a thrifty way of creating scroll-stopping video from your show or podcast from Broadcast Bionics. Pretty cool stuff, Camera One. And you know, there's, there's various systems that switch cameras for you. Camera One has so many cool features that you'll actually use. Uh, especially when you post to social media. Uh, check it out from Broadcast Bionics at bionics.co.uk or bionic.radio. There's links in the show notes if you want to find out more about that. And as an engineer, uh, you can really be a hero to your, your broadcasting company uh, by encouraging uh, adoption of this kind of technology. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack. Uh, Chris Tarr will be back in a few minutes. And we are ex uh, we're watching um, this interview uh, I had with uh, Robert Combs and uh, Dominic and um, uh, Dominic Mitchum, and and it's about installing this new transmitter. So part two is here now. We got lots more video and B roll to show you what's going on there. Let's roll it, Suncast. Kind of tell me about the this Gates Air transmitter that's gone in here. It's not. I know we're raising our voice a bit, but it's quieter than a tube transmitter, I believe. Oh yes, it it does have high speed fans. If if there's a problem, you walk in the door, you'll know it because you can't hear anything. Ah. Uh, but this this is basically three. Uh, 10 kilowatt uh, power blocks yep. combined. Yep. Um, you have two in this one cabinet, which is fed by the exciter, okay. which there's a combiner for them. And then you have a third one here that is off, then combined with these other two. Yep. And then it comes has the output that comes out. Uh, with these transmitters, of course, there is no harmonic filter. On the external, it's really? all inside. Oh, it's inside. Okay. Everything's inside. The uh, exciter is the brain. Yeah, you 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 connect all the audio through it. Uh, this first power block is the brain of the three. Yeah. So there's ribbon cables coming from all three into that the first one, to where it will tell you if there's a problem with one, and it sort of controls everything. 
And of course, with the Gates Air stuff, as with most of it now, um, you can use SMNP for remote control, or it has the 25 dB connector, um, mm -hmm. or you can just, they make equipment to hook, you know, through the network. Of course, they have great GUIs um, yeah. for e internet control as well. Dominic, for the remote control, how have you guys got this one hooked this up one to is, your bird? This one is configured through SMMP. Really? Yes. That's cool. That's cool. It's very cool. I'd love to play with more of that. I haven't played much. I mean, everything. The, the commands, the, the, the metering, the status, uh, just everything you want to know on it. Wow. Tell me about plumbing work, taking these transmitters to a, a switch, right? Right. We have an RF switch in the back, um, which both transmitters go into. We have an output for the end going up to the antenna. It's currently adapted to go to five inch line, which we'll replace with the three inch. Um, and then there's a fourth port that can go to the aux antenna, which we don't have hooked up yet. We still got the cover over that. Um, so once we get under new line for that, it'll go directly into the switch as well. So we can still work on the other one if one's down and be able to not have to switch back and forth. Yeah. Um, to test it. We just shut one down, turn this one on, see if it's okay, and I'll work on it as we need to. I did mean to ask you that earlier. You're replacing the old transmission line, which was sized for a higher transmitter power output with a slightly smaller line, right? Right. Uh, I usually, if it's 30 to 32 kilowatts, is as much as I like to run on three inch line. Yeah. Uh, then there's four inch line, which will go up to about 40. Huh. 45 maybe. I mean, the specs say it'll go yeah. know, forever, but the specs also say that 7 eight line will do 9 kilowatts. Yeah. And it will for about 5 seconds. <laughs> but so with us running 54 kilowatts, we they went to the 5-inch line. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, we're in uh, a little bit of a rural area. There's There are nice homes on the way up here. But uh, tell me about Internet access. I do see a, a 4G modem up there, but you've got some, some better stuff up here too, don't you? Yes, in fact, we have uh, two fiber trunks in here. One is from the uh, company named Wow, and the other is from AT&T. And what method are you using for your studio to transmit or link? Well, we're using a microwave right now. It's a digital STL with uh, made by uh, 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 Gates Air. Gates Air, okay. HD Link. Yeah, gotcha. It's HD Link, and it teleports uh, the audio, and it's capable of teleporting data. And uh, we're just right now it's set up for digital audio. Cool. Now, we're in northern Alabama. Uh, I would imagine that you don't get a lot of snow here, but you do get some ice storms from time to time. Yes. In fact, back in January, we had a bit of a winter event here. About three inches of snow fell up here. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, we stayed on the air. Oddly enough, the transmitter folded uh, back just a little bit, not much. Uh, and that was the old transmitter, by the way. Uh, it stayed on until maybe three days after the, the real cold ended. And the temperatures were in the 30s, and I had to come up because of uh, it got cold itself, and the room was like 40 degrees in here, and yeah. I just had to restart it. It was no problem. Tell me a bit more about that. We've talked about removing the old transmitter, and you mentioned this one's a lot lighter, so it was easier to, to get in. What are some of the concerns about leveling it up and setting it in place and kind of making sure you've got all the right availability of uh, AC power and 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 that kind of thing. How do you plan for that and how do you execute it? Well, I, I will uh, hand the details of the installation to Robert, but for moving it, it was really the moving company that made it easier. I just basically pointed to them. Now, knowing that the floor is not going to be perfect, we like to use uh, some stock lumber just to cushion the load and balance it, just give a little, little uh, uh, leveling, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so. Once that was in place, and uh, then Robert came in and did his planning and then uh, took over. Talk about your planning process. Well, with these, they are very light. As long as, you, you know, but the modules are shipped separately. Ah, okay. The power supplies are shipped separately. So, like your dresser at home, you take the drawers out. Yes. Okay. You take the drawers out. And then, you know, with a guy my size, I can lean this back and I can walk it. Ah. Or I use gas pipe from Home Depot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. and just roll it, roll it. Yeah. and I even bought a roller on Amazon that does great too if I need it um, but then you just you have to have these you know this far apart there's little braces inside ah. that has a number eight screw that you loosen put it in tighten it down 
So that makes these be the exact same height, the exact space apart. You have to then run the electrical from here into this. Okay. Um, you know, you want, you try to make these, unlike the old transmitters, these transmitters pull air from the front. Oh, okay. And exhaust either the top or the back. We have vented doors on this one, so it'll go out the back and the, the top. They also make it with uh, solid doors, so you can force it all to the top. Okay. Um, so you have to make sure you have air coming from the front. Most sites have it coming from the back. I mean, every time, you yeah. know, because those old transmitters pull air from the back, exhaust it out the top. So that's one of the, the big things you have to make sure you're ready for or that air is circulating enough to where you can keep it cool. And then it, without the harmonic filter up the top, all you gotta do is just have clear for your plumbing. Okay, so the, the any harmonic filtering is internal or it yes. doesn't, okay. Yes. It's not external like like most tube transmitters work. Right, the, uh, the harmonic filter, the uh, directional coupler, everything is inside the box. Okay, wow. And what about your AC power? Are you using the same uh, power that fed the old transmitter, or did you run something new? We ran new line, new uh -huh. site. It, we the old one has number had number one. With this, you know, we only needed three odd for okay. this because we went from 200 amps to 175, uh -huh. and then we you know ran of course the ground wire uh, to go with it, and then we made sure we had copper strap, um, which we have four inch copper strap run into it as well. All right, what's the procedure? when you punch the on button the first time, like, are you nervous? Do you need a cigarette? How, how does this How does this work? You don't need the broom handle anymore. Because I'm sure a lot of guys that remember, you know, especially with those some of those old CCAs and yes. McMartins, you yes. know, you use the broom handle so you'd be by the door. With this, I mean, it, it's, it's gradual. I mean, you hit the on button, make sure your exciter's on, then you turn your, your main on, and it just slowly ramps up ah, okay. and, you, and you go in and tell it what your TPO needs to be. And then you, the one thing that I have to get used to with these, about every, about once a quarter, you have to calibrate your transfer. Oh, okay. You, you have to reboot it basically. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, but you, you, there's a procedure to go in and calibrate it and tell it, you know, cause your TPO will drift. I had a transmitter that was licensed for 22.5, and uh, after about two years, somebody said, well, it's only doing seven and a half kilowatts out, but it, the front says 22.5. They hadn't calibrated it. So it thought it was still doing 22.5, but it wasn't. So I, I tell my guys to do that about once a quarter. Now, this station, WCYP, I believe you told me you're not doing any HD on this station, but this transmitter uh, can be ordered that way, right? Yes, uh, the exciter, all it takes is the X-Gen card being installed in the exciter, uh, and then you order the uh, importer-exporter. Yeah. And yeah, they and you can do it in the field. Um, I've done several in the field with uh, with their tech support. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's very simple to do. Right? And so this got turned on for the first time what day? Actually, it was uh, yesterday, yesterday, no, day before, Wednesday, 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 Wednesday. Yes. Wednesday. That's maybe that's when I saw the, the, fo the post. So 12, 1230 Wednesday. 1230 in the afternoon or in yeah. the morning? Oh, wow. Just up in the middle of the day. Yes, we had them. <laughs> we had them on. Um, we have a, a little small auxiliary transmitter. Yeah. That we kept them on with while we tore out all the plumbing and redid it. Now, Robert, after doing 60, 60 of these in the past few years, do you still punch the on button yourself, or do you let Dominic do that? I give him a choice. I, get, I, I offered to he, let him do it. He offered, and I, because I was brand new, and he was more versed on it, I didn't want to be the guy with the broomstick, uh, uh, you know, having that sort of moment there. So I let him uh, have the honors. So let's think about uh, ongoing maintenance. What, with a transmitter like this, that is air-cooled like a tube, but it's uh, I think it's a lot less air, certainly lower velocity air, what do you have to do with it? You, you mentioned the calibration every quarter, but what else do you have to do over time to keep this baby running? Filters, of filters. course. Yeah. You have filters in the back, you have filters in the front, um, and you just have to keep your air conditioning going. Yeah. Um, the good thing is if you have to, you can get a giant fan, stick it right here, and it'll shoot right through. Ah, okay. And now think about 
when you're long retired and you are too, and I am too, and this thing needs to come out, I, I wonder what the technology is going to be at that point. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, right now you've got 10 kilowatts in a six rack unit space. Yeah. yeah. So I look, you know, for 20, 20 or 30 kilowatts to be in a six to eight rack space. The, some of the new manufacturers in, in Vegas last year had, you know, they were doing almost two kilowatts per module. Oh, yeah. So you can, what I'm doing with six, with eight here, you can do with four. Gotcha. So it, it's getting smaller and smaller as it goes. Well, Dominic, you got a you got a new baby to, to babysit here, don't you? Yes, I do. But you know, I'm very happy uh, the, the the HT30 has served us well here. Yeah. Uh, it behaved very well during the time I've been here. But I'm really looking forward to the new transmitter. Robert, I'm I'm glad that uh, Cumulus has taken the idea to replace transmitters. And and is this helping with the electricity bills? In some cases, okay. um, the one thing about these solid state transmitters. The higher to your max power that you run, the better efficient it is. Oh. Uh, you know, so we're not to get seventy-two percent efficiency. We've got to run thirty kilowatts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but the air conditioning is not as bad. Yeah, you still need it, but yeah. it's not as bad. Um, but you know, we get these with warranties. That the biggest thing is the warranty. Ah, um, sure. which you know we haven't had any major problems with any of the transmitters we've installed. It, but for many of the manufacturers over the last few years, but that warranty is nice to have. Now I'm guessing that if uh, if you are replacing a transmitter, um, don't call Robert because he's got probably 60 more to replace <laughs> in, in the next few years. Yeah, you know, it depends on how much money you got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Dominic, uh, you got a, you got a good transmitter here to to take care of. I I, I do, and yeah. uh, you know something. Uh, uh, you know, the efficiency and, and just having the peace of mind knowing that uh, I have something new here that is going to last a long time and I can focus on other other things. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And we do, we do want to say Bobby Dotson, who's oh, yeah. our uh, regional engineering for this area and our director of engineering in Memphis, ah. was here. He had to go home yesterday, um, but he was a big part of this as well. Thanks, so we, we want to throw him in there, too. Thank you, Bobby. All right. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been a great tour. And I appreciate your time and, and your talent. Thanks for sharing with us. I'm Kirk Harnack on location here just north of Huntsville, Alabama. What's the name of this mountain again? Capshaw Mountain. Cap Capshaw Mountain at WZYP. Great call letters. We'll see you next time on Twerks. And there you go. Wow, that was a lot of fun. And thanks to Robert Combs and Dominic Mitchum for being such terrific hosts. And, of course, stellar engineers. Uh, Robert has, has, has been doing this for, for so long. Uh, not just transmitters, of course, but uh, we had Robert on years ago with uh, a backstage at the uh, at the CMA Awards, um, where he showed uh, all all the radio gear that they were using then. That was back in the ISDN days. Chris Tarr, um, I wonder if you might have a, a comment on that conversation or installation. What what do you think? Uh, that that was really really nice looking, uh, and and yeah. it's interesting because uh, I just went through that a couple of times, so. Uh, everything he said was spot on. So it was really, it was really, uh, it was good to watch. And I'll tell you, you know, I'm, they're going to be so much happier with that than the dual thirties. Uh, so I'm looking forward to how that's going to work out for them. There, there, there's one shot. I didn't get to B roll into there. Uh, Dominic held up one of the power tubes from, from the 30 kilowatt transmitter. Uh, and we got a good look at that, but I, I didn't have a good place to, to <laughs> B roll that in. So. But you know, for, for these young folks out there who haven't seen a transmitter tube, it's, it was pretty impressive. I, th I think it was a, a 4CX 20,000. That sounds that right. Sound about right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The 20 wow. uses a 15,000. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Chris, you have um, some video to show, and I've got pictures to show. If we have time, we're going to get to yours first. Um, hey, you're watching This Week in Radio Tech. It's our episode number uh, 689. I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tarr, and we have uh, we'll, we'll be we'll be back with some more here in just a minute. Right now, I want to tell you about this great great product from Innovonics. It's something that really we all need this kind of solution. It's for your EAS. It's your EAS receivers. Uh, you know, you're supposed to listen over the air to uh, you know your your uh, your whoever your assignment is. 
Maybe it's an LP1 uh, designated station. Maybe it's a station that retransmits that. Whatever it may be, uh, could be an FM station, could be a couple of FMs, an FM and an AM. And probably NOAA Weather Radio is going to be in that list of things that you're supposed to monitor at your federally licensed broadcast station for EAS purposes. Well, Innovonics has this, their brand new 677 triple tuner. There it is, the model 677 triple tuner. It is now shipping, so it's 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 actually made of obtainium now. Uh, it's an EAS monitor receiver in a compact half rack package. Uh, it's got three built-in discrete frequency agile receivers, and each one can be AM or FM or NOAA. Uh, NOAA Weather Radio, so you don't have to have you know one of each, or even order it uh, you know the, some particular uh, way. Uh, it's flexible. Each receiver has a balanced mono XLR audio output, serve as an EAS monitor uh, or off-air monitor. If you, if you need to you know use one of these to monitor your off-air station, your station's off-air, you can do that too. Um, it has an easy front panel setup with jog wheel menu navigation. And on the back panel, it's got six rear panel GPOs. They can be user assigned to alarm functions. And, and of course, has a web interface. And you, I tell you, Innovonics does such a great job on their web interfaces. It provides control and monitoring remotely. You can, you can browse to this and listen to the radio. You can listen to these receivers, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. Um, you can listen you know, remotely by that web stream. It also has SNMP fully supported. Chris Tarr is over there doing, doing a little happy dance because he likes that. And uh, uh, and someday the rest of us will figure that out and we'll like it too. Um, so check this thing out. This is the Model 677 from Innovonics. Yeah, good stuff. There's a product review available of this uh, online. If you go to their website, uh, what Suncast has been showing, uh, the Innovonics, um, you can see a review from Jeremy Priest, who's the Director of Engineering for EMF. Uh, he's uh, he's put some of these in and got a, a great Great review there. So check this thing out. Of course, you can get it from your favorite supplier and mine, Broadcasters General Store. Uh, the website, bgs.cc. Go there, get your best price. Give them a call, say, hey, save me some more money. <laughs> get your sharp pencil out, as my friend Sam Phillips used to say. Um, and uh, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll get you the best price and tell you when delivery is going to be. Uh, help you out in every single way at Broadcasters General Store. Hey, I just had a conference call this morning with uh, Broadcaster General Store and uh, Jessica Shute. Hey, Jessica, uh, thanks for all your hard work and, and uh, informing uh, broadcast engineers, you know, when stuff's available, best price you can get on it, things like that. Really appreciate Broadcaster General Store. All righty, it's Kirk Harnack and Chris Tarr talking about transmitters. That, that was a new transmitter we just saw, a new Harris, uh, sorry, Gates Air, sorry. Old habits die hard, don't they, Chris? Uh, and uh, that was their their thirty kilowatt model. Chris, you've been uh, doing some transmitter uh, installations. I, I guess, like Robert Combs, you haven't stopped. So, no, what's going no, on? I, I just on keep life? doing it. <laughs> well, first, yeah. I, I, I uh, watching your video of driving up the uh, driving up the mountain there. Uh, it reminded me that I did a video not too long ago of one of my sites, and people think of the Midwest as being flat. And I, I did this video just to kind of show that All right, it is actually not Here we the are. case. 10 Bluffs Drive in Minnesota. Ooh. Up to our Minnesota Tower. Look at that road. That doesn't look too bad, right? That looks like it's pretty drivable. Nothing wrong with that. Oh, wait. That's our road. This, this <laughs> is our road. All right. So let's go. Uh, let's see if we can get up here. Oh. All right, so we start heading up this way. Try to keep my hand steady. Oof. This is why oh, we have four wheel drive. All right, so we got, you know, so far so good. Uh, you know, but let me show you this. That's the edge right there. We'll go a little bit farther here where it really gets close to the edge. So yeah, you can see right there, you know, you're having a bad day if you go off that side. All right, so here we go. We'll continue on up the hill here. All right, Oof. and we're moving, we're moving. Oh, got a little uh, moss growing in here. Some grass. Oh, oof -da. Oh. 
see oh, how man. much we're actually getting bounced around here. So here we go. Still got, you know, a bluff on this side and a total dropout on that side. Again, if you're uh, if you're sliding down this in the winter like I've done, like here's another great example of it just goes right down into the ravine. Oh my god. Yeah, no, you it's, can fly it's a down here in the winter. And you're pretty much white knuckling. Alright, so we're getting, oh. <laughs> we're getting there. You're with my exhaust probably. Right. So we come around this corner here. And we go up a little hill. <laughs> go over some more bumps. Again, that's why, you know, it's really important here to have four wheel drive. Because it's really not even a road. It's more of a... <laughs> and you can't see the bumps because of all the leaves. It's really more of a path. So, oh, look. Look, the road ends. We must be, uh... We must be at the top. Uh... Nope. <laughs> we got more to go. Alright, so here we go. Oh, by the way... Here, let me uh, hold on the window and hold this out to see if you can see. I don't know if you can actually see that, but once again, it goes right down into the, uh, into the All right, so here we go. Continue up the hill here. Uh, We're getting close. Open. We're getting close. All right. Oh. Okay. Oh, up the hill. Up the hill. Oh, turn around. Sometimes just to keep things on the road here. All right, so here we go. Oof. Look at that. Did we make it? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got to go up over the rocks. Ugh. And up some more. Oh my here goodness. we go. Now we're almost there. Going up this part of the trail. Ugh. And we're moving, we're moving, we're moving. Going up the trail. Why is it so much fun? Sun here. It's kind of nice. <laughs> and and I, I love the sound right. effects. I love the grunts. You know, what we oh, all do. I know. We get going. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, you right. know, on, on behalf of the yeah. vehicle, you know, we're right. yeah. grunting. <laughs> I'm just trying to hang on. All right, I'm just yeah. trying to hang on at that point. Uh, I hear you. All right. Have we made it? Have we made it? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yes. We are finally oh my, here. No. Uh, the green, green grass of home. <laughs> there's the building so, and there's the tower. I hope you had lots of fun. There we go. Beautiful. So I, I just wanted to show that just because it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, people sometimes think the Midwest, oh, you know, you just, it's out in the middle of a farm field. Not always, not always. Now imagine doing that, like in the rain or the snow or, you know, it's just crazy, which is, again, it's why I have a Jeep because I got to be able to get up there and, and do those things. So anyway, I just figured I'd share that real quick. Um, so, uh, transmitters, uh, what I originally was going to talk about here, um, you know, with tube transmitters, the tubes are getting, as you know, Kirk, they're getting harder and harder to find. And when you can find them, they're expensive. So, told, yeah. yeah. So we've been trying to get solid state transmitters at all of our sites. Well, you know, when you've got all these stations, you can't always buy new. I mean, you, you, we'd love to, and we have bought a couple of new ones, but we just can't afford to outfit all of them with brand new solid state transmitters. So what we're finding now is some of these older uh, solid state transmitters are getting retired. Either they were, you know, uh, the one I'm going to talk about in a minute was actually uh, used as an HD transmitter in a um, in a high level combined system. So, you know, there are some of these things that are starting to come up. Um, I had another one that was out in Kansas that I bought on a station that ended up going off the air. Uh, so, if you know, uh, uh, what we've been doing is we've just been patient and. 
as soon as an opportunity comes up, I jump at it. Now, our friend Paul Jellison, I know you know, um, mm -hmm. out in uh, uh, out in Cincinnati, um, he yeah. had a, a, a five kilowatt uh, BE transmitter, uh, an FMI two hundred one, which is basically, you know, I think it's a kilowatt and a half HD, three kilowatts analog. Um, they had just pulled out because they replaced it with a low level transmitter. And he was selling it at a great price. So I bought it, drove a van out there and picked it up and brought it home. And, and we're going to put it on the air. The 10 kilowatt, that's a whole other story. I drove a big, huge truck out to uh, middle of nowhere, Kansas, and picked that well, up. And that right. one's on the air now. Yeah, that one's yeah. on the air now. I also bought another one from Las Vegas and had it shipped. So, you know, the, the key, though, is there's a lot of good stuff. And there's a lot of junk. So... You know, you really have to be careful about, you know, what you're doing with these transmitters and do your homework. I know for the, especially the, like the Las Vegas one, um, I know that Nautel has really good records. So I called Jeff Welton and I said, hey, can you check the service records on this transmitter? And, uh, you know, tell me if this has been in a bunch of times or, um, you know, uh, you know, if, if there's been a lot of support tickets open and, and Jeff's like, nope, there's been one. <laughs> in all the years wow it's like wow yeah. okay yeah good so i made the arrangements to do that and then you know the the one went the one in kansas um i had them show me a very good video and show me where it was living so that i knew kind of where it was stored and then paul right. actually has a has a rig set up in his in his shop where he can plug it in and turn it on uh so we've you know we've gotten i don't think we spent more than on all of those transmitters i think it may have been fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars total. Let's tell you what. Um, I, I know we've only got uh, another fifteen minutes max uh, in the show, um, and that's our usual practice of going overtime a bit. But you, why don't we talk for a minute about when you're when you're buying a a new transmitter? Not too many things to consider with regard to um, uh, expected longevity. It may not be particularly known sure. but when you but when you're buying a used transmitter you know what do you look for you can't exactly take it to the used transmitter mechanic and have them give it a thorough once over that's kind of your job as, as, as an engineer uh, i wonder if we might talk about some of the things but just for a second on the new transmitter i don't know you might want to avoid serial number one or two or ten <laughs> uh you know you you, 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 you might want to wait till they've kind of rung those things out and right. sometimes you can't be avoided right <laughs> i i installed serial number either one or two of a 50 kilowatt Nautel. In, sure. uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, and it was fine. It was really fine. Couple tweaks here and there over, you know, some some er early uh, growing pains, but not not much at all. It, it was actually quite good. Um, sure. When you buy a used transmitter, I, and I'll, I'll you, you go ahead and take off here in a second, but you know, ma make sure that no engineer has gone in there and like cut a wiring harness and rewired <laughs> some stuff. There, there's no need for that. Uh, I've seen that done to transmitters in the South, maybe elsewhere too, but well, it didn't work. So we simplified the control ladder. No, no, thanks. Just yeah. hands off of that. Don't need that. Um, also there's companies that have gone out of business like Energionics. Um, sure. I, I know I've, a lot of people have Energionics stories. Um, from my, from my experience, not so bad, really. Uh, you know, I, 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 I knew and liked Bernie Wise, you know, the, the mm -hmm. proprietor and, and we, he sent me on, on a few good jobs. Um, but other than that, Chris, what are mm -hmm. some things that uh, what what might be a, a hard no in terms of the transmitter's condition or age or manufacture anything like that? And and and, and what's a maybe we need to check this out? Sure. Well, a maybe is uh, I bought an HT10, uh, and and I can't remember now where it was from. It was at a, a, a public station of some sort, and we were only looking for a backup transmitter, actually a backup to a backup at a site that we had and this one became available for a reasonable price and it had some work done i mean it's an older ht10 but we knew that we have the guys that can kind of whip that back into shape so for that price and the condition it was in it was in good condition but it obviously was in life for a long time in service and so you know it's going to need a little work that was a that was an okay um you know the the one i just got from from paul that was a definite yes uh, Kansas was a definite yes. Las Vegas was a definite yes. I think, you know, you have to use common sense. You know, in, in the cases of the, you know, the three that, excuse me, the three solid state transmitters that I bought, 
I talked to the people first on the phone, got a feel for kind of how they, you know, Paul, I knew. So that was, <laughs> you know, we all know Paul. So that was not a big deal. But uh, in, you know, in terms of Kansas and Vegas, you know, talk to them and get a feel for, uh, you know, the the kind of person that they are and, and where the transmitter lived. You know, if, if something was in a bad situation in the first place, you probably want to pass. You also want to find out why they're getting rid of it. Um, you know, in the case of, for example, you know, this older Nautel that was in in uh, in Reno, um, I, you know, why are you getting rid of it? And it was very simple. He's like, yeah, we got an upgrade. I need more power, more TPO. So we're retiring this one and and getting another one. Great. I mean, that's, you know, that's what I like to hear. And then you do your research. You know, most transmitters, if it's something that's in a, a current manufacturer, you can call that manufacturer, give them the serial number and get all of the, you know, what parts have been ordered, what, you know, uh, what has been opened for uh, support and that sort of thing. And sometimes they'll say, well, you need to, you know, I need to get permission from the owner. And if, you know, if they don't give you the permission, then that's a, another red flag. Um, you know, the hard no's are going to be things that, you know, are, you, you just look at them and they're dusty and scratched up and obviously not well taken care of. Um, also, if they're kind of dodgy about, uh, you know, questions that they should know the answers to, uh, because you also don't want to have something like a middleman who bought it from somewhere and is just flipping it, um, you know, ask the questions that really ascertain, you know, how, how long was it in service? You know, have you had any problems with it? Um, you know, the, the kinds of questions that the, you know, an owner of a transmitter or, or an engineer of a transmitter is going to know the answers to. Um, so those are the big things. And then also, you know, when you, when you go to do this, you got to think about shipping because that's also a cost. Now, in the case of, of, uh, of Paul's thing in Cincinnati, it's a short drive for me. So I hopped in a minivan and went down yeah. to a small transmitter, went down there, loaded, you know, he and I loaded it up and it came back, um, in, uh, the, for the 10 kilowatt in, uh, out in, uh, out west uh, in Kansas, I had to get a U-Haul and go out there. Uh, but again, you know, and again, you also need to get straps and everything else for this because you don't want it bouncing around and, you know, you want to <laughs> make sure that it's packed up. Um, and then for Reno, I actually hired uh, a, a company out in Reno uh, that went and professionally packaged the transmitter and put it on a, uh, you know, on a, on a pallet. And then I used a less than load shipping company to ship it from Reno to me. Uh, and even with oh. that, you know, that I think in the end, that was about $3,500 in packing and shipping. But in the end, it's still way cheaper than a, a, a solid, you know, than a new solid state transmitter. And you got to remember with solid state, generally, if it's a, you know, it's a, if it's a mature model, like I wouldn't go and buy, you know, uh, whatever those are, TTLs or whatever, you know, they're really old first gen yeah. digital yeah. stuff. But, you know, this is one of the gray faced uh, Nautel FMs and they, you know, they have a really good solid history. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when I did that and I called Jeff and I got the information, even at, you know, with the shipping and everything else, I think I was in under $10,000. Uh, and that's a steal for that. I mean, I've had it on the air now for two years. I've never had a problem with it. Um, you mm -hmm. know, same thing with the 10 kilowatt from, from Kansas, uh, that's been on well over a year now without a single failure. So, you know, use your head, um, you know, and, and don't expect that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think of a good way to put this. If you're, if you're looking for a tube transmitter, I would be very hesitant to buy those used. Let me put it that way. Um, because there's a lot of junk out there. And yeah. generally somebody's getting rid of a tube transmitter because they're sick of the problems <laughs> or yeah, they're sick of the I, cost of the tubes or, or something like that. Probably, um, so and, really, and, 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 and so many tube transmitters, frankly, would put up with a lot of, of lack of care. Right. Uh, right. And, and, uh, and, and so they finally decide to sell it. You, you might, I'm not saying all tube transfer like this at all, but a good percentage of them have a lack of care. Yes. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I would also say what has helped us a lot too is we're really easy to work with and, you know, we don't call and immediately go, well, I want you to sell it for five grand less and, you know, playing hardball and that sort of thing. And in fact, that's really done us well because in, in the Kansas one, um, one of the power supplies was bad and they told us that they were up front and they said, Hey, listen, you know, um, we've got a bad power supply on this just for selling it with that. Just so you know, and yeah, it's no big deal. 
Um, it turns out, you know, we got along so well that before I got there, he had shipped it out to uh, BE to get it replaced on their dime. So by the time I got back, there was a power supply waiting for me to uh, be paid for. Nice, so, nice. you know, I, 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 be nice. And, uh, you know, you'll get a lot more information that way if they like you. <laughs> um, so, again, it, it's it's just all about the homework. If If something doesn't feel right, walk away. By the way, my, my t- uh, well, hey, I'll save my, my tip of the week for after our last commercial break. Uh, you're watching This Week in Radio Tech, Kirk Harnack, Chris Tarr, uh, and we're just about done talking about transmitters. But we do have a tip of the week. <laughs> I, I, got a, I, I got one that's absolutely true, and it, it'll, it'll really help you out. If, if, you, if, you, if you don't do it, oh, wow. Okay, uh, our show's brought to you in part by Angry Audio. Don't get mad, get angry, and talk to Chris Tarr, because he's going to tell you about something at Angry Audio. Chris, what you got? Ah, yes. Angry Audio, my friends. I love those guys. Uh, Once again, we're going to talk about their chameleon, uh, mostly because, again, somebody else online, they keep talking about these things. It's just a a Mm -hmm. huge, huge hit. Uh, We've got the the C-Level, which is the processor for on-air. Um, they've got the, the, the other C series, which is, they've got the C6S, which is software, the C4, which is for streams, C3 for your headphones. Uh, these processors are fantastic. And what they do is they take the place of the now defunct, uh, Apex compellers and the Ariane's and they actually, they do a way better job than those boxes anyway. Uh, you know, basically, you know, you take any modern processor or even older processors and one of the weak spots is always the agc on these boxes Mm. and they're usually single band they're usually kind of you know they're they're an afterthought because it's just something that's always been there and they're easy to design and so they don't really put a lot of effort into that um so that's usually the weak spot and especially when you're talking about you're taking your audio and before you multi-band it you're putting it through a wide band agc so why would you want to do that? So what this is, it's a multi-band AGC. It's very transparent, very musical, and it just adds this dimension to your sound. And so what I do on my processors, I turn off the AGC and I use that ahead of the processor. And I'll tell you what, the first day we had it on the air, we had uh, one of our, our programming people and uh, the station owner in the car, and they were like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, what what is going on here i mean this i'm hearing things in these songs i've never heard before and this was and and this was audio that was being shipped up over fiber from you know almost the entire state away and and we're sitting there in the car and it's just the the fullness and all of the audio this the quality was fantastic so this is and, and and not only on the air but they have the the version for the streaming that does just as well they've got the software version that's great for um you know if you want to put together a uh you know, a computer for processing, the C6S is good for that as well. So, you know, get yourself into the modern times and get yourself uh, audio processing that is, uh, it's clean, it's modern, it sounds great, and it's going to help you solve that problem. AngryAudio.com, check them out. They don't not only do the processing, but they have all other kinds of gizmos and gadgets to make your job easier. So, you know, when you need to get it done, get angry at Angry Audio. <laughs> See, I already lost my yep. angryaudio.com. That's going to happen. <laughs> I keep talking. Thank, thank you, Chris. I have been drinking. Our show. We, we talked about this. I don't sh- drink. Our, our show is also brought to you by uh, Max Connect Wireless. And, and, you know, these days it's becoming more and more ubiquitous that you have internet at a transmitter site. And there's so many things that you can do with internet at the transmitter site, but you can't get it everywhere yet. So that's where. Um, Max Connect Wireless comes in, not only for internet for the transmitter site, but also for remote broadcast, you know, live remote sporting events. Uh, maybe the internet goes out at your radio station and you got to have it. You need a backup. Here is John Takar to uh, tell you something good about Max Connect. With all of the recent cybersecurity attacks against large corporations, we were looking for a product that would give us the ultimate security at our transmitter sites and as well as with our broadcast equipment. Max Connect fits the bill very well. Its greatest security feature is the fact that it gives you a single static IP address. Using this single static IP address allows us to close hundreds of open ports on our firewalls across the company and restrict access to only the Max Connect IPs. This has greatly reduced our exposure to the World Wide Web 
and made us much more secure moving forward. It has also given us the ability to expand as needed in a secure fashion. You know, they keep adding features to the MaxConnect wireless service. So to get the latest on what's going on with MaxConnect wireless and how they can help you with uh, even faster speeds these days, uh, get, uh, go to the website. It's maxconnect.com. I know it's spelled funny, M-A-X-X-K-O-N-N-E-C-T, because the Internet's popular. Uh, and go give him a call, and you will get the lowdown on what MaxConnect Wireless can do for you. Really reliable. Oh, my goodness, several times. Uh, I have, uh, even though, hey, I, I, I don't have many, any MaxConnect at any of my transmitter sites permanently because we're able to get uh, either wired or fiber uh, at our transmitter sites. But I've built transmitter sites and haven't got internet there yet. Use Max Connect. That's how we got Oxford, Mississippi on the air with FM, HD1, HD2, and HD3. Got it all going, full remote control, full everything uh, with Max Connect. And then we, I had a station in Memphis, Tennessee, um, a, a community station, WEVL. And pff, internet was off for four days uh, from, uh, from you know who, Comcast. And so, um, and it's business service. Yeah. And so anyway, Max Connect saved the day, uh, drove down there, got him back on the air in uh, half an hour, and bam, uh, absolutely wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And I've done some of the uh, this, this show, Twert, with, uh, with the Max Connect wireless. So check him out, maxconnect.com. We'll have a link in the show notes. Good stuff. Okay, Chris, we've just got a minute left. Got a, do you have a tip for us? I do. Uh, Max Connect, uh, if you can, get a spare one and bring it with you. Uh, I had an issue the other day where I lost an internet connection at a translator site. And instead mm. of scrambling around and being off the air, I have one in my car. So I drove over there, popped the Max Connect in, got it back on the air while I fixed the other stuff. So, um, you know, I always, I'm always a big proponent of, you know, bring emergency tools with you. Good, good tip. And thank, and, and with our sponsor too. And my tip of the week is if you buy a used tube transmitter that has an external harmonic filter, you know, the big long pipe, Maybe it's got a couple of little T's yeah. on it and does stuff. Okay. You buy one of those, two things. Number one, be sure you get it and bring it with you when you go pick yes. up the transmitter. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be running illegally. You'll have harmonics. And number two, um, what happened to me one time was this station was at the high end of the dial, and there was some extra center conductor sticking out of this T, and they decided they would hacksaw it off because they didn't need it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and the station that we moved the transmitter to was on the other end of the dial and the thing needed to go whoop out like this uh, and uh, let's just say that it got close but yeah close yeah jeez yeah so anyway yeah it, it, it should have had an accommodation for that but of course i didn't realize that until we got it all the way back um, another thing is if, you, if you're going to put an FM antenna, let's say you buy a used FM antenna and you put it on like an open trailer or even into a, a U-Haul, put some padding under it. Don't let the antenna, yes. Absolutely. The, the metal Bounce is soft in there. Yeah. Yep. and, and it'll, and, and, and it will, yeah, rub a hole in the antenna. Ask mm -hmm. me how I know. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've made all the mistakes. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. We got, we got to go. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it very oh, much. Happy to be here. And thanks to Suncast for uh, putting the show together here with me. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, we'll have another great show next week. I don't know from where, from how, but we're going to do something cool. So we'll see you next week on This Week in